Good morning, everyone. If you could come in and take your seats, we will get started. I know you uh, had a lot to enjoy at the keynote this morning. They let you a little bit out late, so we're starting a little bit late to accommodate that. Apologies. So welcome to Vancouver. It's a pretty exciting time. Uh, we have a great lineup today, and I'm pretty excited to share with you briefly that uh, you know, high-level overview so you know what's going on here. Um, we have a number of talks here in, in this room throughout the day. We're going to hear from folks like Monty Taylor and Bill Franklin this morning. In the afternoon after lunch, we're going to have a customer panel. We're going to look at some very exciting open NFV and some uh, Swift stuff as well, which is pretty awesome. So if you're not already familiar with our lounge, which is over here, uh, you definitely want to check it out. There's going to be s'mores there for you to enjoy. We're going to have some craft beer starting around 3 o'clock. There's also going to be an uh, acoustic guitar player there for you to enjoy. And of course, uh, if you come back down to our booth at around uh, 6.10 today, there's going to be, uh, of course, the, all of the booths are going to be open. Uh, then we're going to do the pub crawl there. So lots of great food and drink for you to enjoy. We're also going to have custom uh, hoodies, and you're going to be able to actually uh, impress on them uh, little badges for the different projects and whatnot to help represent who you are. We also have the, the huge hospitality event, which is going to take place this Tuesday. So if you haven't already RSVP'd, make sure you do that. It's going to, that's going to sell out very quickly. And uh, we also have um, <clears throat> uh, lightning talks at the last session for today. So it's going to start at 5.30 and go to 6.10. Lots of great different presenters from, from the community and HP who's going to share with you in five minute chunks some really exciting ideas. And at the end of that, uh, at the end of those lightning talks, we're going to be giving away an HP Slate 10 inch tablet uh, running Android. So you'll definitely want to be here for that. When you come in, you'll get a ticket and we'll do a draw at the end of that lightning talks. So you may have noticed when you came in that there is a survey on your seat. I'd ask that uh, at the end of uh, each present, at the end of the presentation, uh, you fill that out for us. Much appreciated. And there'll be two ladies, two beautiful ladies at the, at the doors here that will be able to take those from you. And that's going to just help us understand uh, whether or not the content that we're providing here in this, in the, these the sponsored track sessions today, are um, interesting and provide you know the va value that you're looking for. So I have a short video to show, share with you. Uh, I think you may have seen it actually if you were at the keynote, but if you, if, if you didn't, you'll get to catch up on that now. And then I'll introduce you to our first speaker. So open source is all about collaborating and working together to solve problems. I think there are many in, who would argue that it's actually better technology, open source technology versus proprietary. Open source is probably the greatest trend of our time when it comes to development. The cloud of tomorrow is based on open source technology. And with our more than 20 years of open source experience at HP, it's clear to us that OpenStack is the premier leading open source solution. It's important to HP that we have a strong foundation to build all of the components of OpenStack because we're committed to OpenStack itself. Helion takes what OpenStack does as a generic piece of functionality and builds it into a framework and a product that customers can use for infrastructure and storage cloud. We are here to make sure that OpenStack is good for everybody. The reason that HP is having such success in OpenStack and in open source is because they truly believe in the open source development model and they're able to, to kind of attract people that, that are interested in that as well. In addition to building this awesome piece of technology, we're also building up thousands of awesome technologists who will go out and do other cool things. And they see the benefits of doing things which maybe other companies don't want to do, things like infrastructure and QA and making sure that the, the things that aren't as sexy are done so that the project can be successful. All right, thank you so much. So that was a great video where you got to see it from a number of our uh, technologists at HP. And now I'd like to introduce you to a great gentleman sitting here in front of me, Mr. Bill Franklin. Thanks for that oversell. Great gentleman. Um, I just want to welcome everybody here. Um, HP is proud to be a serious sponsor of OpenStack. 
but it's not just the work that we do that makes OpenStack great. It's actually the work that everybody does. Wow, serious feedback. Um, that everybody does in OpenStack. So I want to thank, thank all of you because without the community, the OpenStack ecosystem wouldn't be what it is. Um, so today, this is the HP track. It actually runs the same time as all the rest of the events. Um, so we're not gonna keep you locked in here away from anything else. Cody is kind of your master of ceremonies. Uh, he was the first speaker in the video and the person who was just up here, Cody Somerville, runs a lot of our uh, evangelism and outreach. Um, so Cody's gonna sort of keep everybody on time and, and schedule today. Um, our first speaker is gonna be Monty Taylor, who I think all of you know, and I'll introduce him in a few seconds. I'm gonna chat a little bit. Um, Tim Leibel, who runs our uh, early access forum, is gonna, gonna talk to you, but instead of just HP talking to you about what we're doing at HP, Tim's gonna have a set of HP customers come up and talk to you about what they're actually doing with our HP products. And then we're gonna talk to you about some of the other HP technologies, and as, as Cody said, we'll have some, some lightning talks at the end. Um, if you weren't at the demo and the keynotes this morning, um, I just wanna make one comment about you got to see our public cloud up and running and doing a lot of stuff. Um, so it is still an active part of everything that we do. Um, we have a bunch of people who are gonna be at the summit. So I would encourage you to go out and look at a lot of the other HP talks. There are more than 50 of them here at the Design Summit um, and at the conference. Uh, Cody was telling you about the other activities that we have going on. But the uh, other thing that's, that's sort of special about HP um, in our role here uh, at OpenStack is we do really try to say thank you to everybody in the community. And I just wanna really reinforce that. Even though you're sitting here on an HP track about it, um, we put a lot of value on all the work that all of you do. Okay, so I wanna say thank you very much for coming. I hope that you will learn something out of all of these. And without much ado, I'm gonna introduce the next speaker, who's also a fine gentleman sitting in the front row, but I'm kidding, um, not kidding. But uh, so if you don't know Monty Taylor, uh, Monty Taylor is one of the few people who sits on both the board of the OpenStack Foundation and on the TC, the technical committee. Uh, Monty, along with, there's a couple of other people scattered around here, Vish I see sitting in the back row and the lights are pretty bright, so it's hard to see all of them. Um, there's a number of people who were involved in the earliest instances of, of OpenStack between Rackspace and, and NASA. Uh, Mark Interante, who was the HP keynote speaker this morning, was actually one of the people who ran that group at Rackspace. Monty Taylor was one of the people involved in it. Um, Monty's been written up in Wired Magazine, a variety of other things as one of the top 25 cloud luminaries. Um, he is a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard. Um, currently, I think, resides somewhere in the East Coast, but more frequently seems to reside in an airplane traveling somewhere around the world. Uh, Monty speaks at a variety of conferences, and when he has spare time, actually leads a lot of uh, infrastructure and other activities inside HP. So without ado, I'd like to welcome Monty Taylor, um, both a fine gentleman and a good friend of mine. To, to watch, uh, oh, I have to get to watch, ooh, gosh, that's loud. This is where we get to watch technology happen. Uh, it's, this isn't quite as exciting as of a demo as this morning, um, but this is, nope, it's other side. Yep, this is, this is where, uh, uh, so HP produces laptops. I don't know if you know that about us. And, uh, and they, they work with projectors. Uh, and I, that's, that's basically what today's talk is about, um, is how good my laptop uh, was at accomplishing that. Uh, so thanks for the intro, Bill. I'd also like to thank uh, Vish for the, the lovely shirt that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm wearing today. Uh, it's, it's great when you have uh, sort of old friends in the community and they make, uh, they make lovely, uh, I created OpenStack and all I got is this lousy t-shirt, t-shirts. So, uh, so anyway, um, in general, I, I think actually that's, uh, uh, I, I tend to just like to talk about myself, so um, if, uh, if you guys don't mind that, uh, it's, it's, I think what we'll just do for the next 45 minutes. Um, okay, maybe not. Um, so uh, I'm assuming, <laughs> since we're here, that I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about um, uh, what, what OpenStack is, and in fact, I've, I've transgressed, uh, uh, I've fully transgressed uh, a thing, which is that I, 
I believe this is going to be the first presentation I've ever given that doesn't have the OpenStack uh, marketing architecture slide in it. Uh, I'm, I'm really sort of uh, confused as to how to start talking about OpenStack without looking at it, but we'll just have to assume um, that, that somewhere there's an architecture and it's important. Uh, it's cloud software. If you're not aware of that, I have no idea how you found your way to this room um, uh, or what it is that you think I'm going to talk about. Um, I, I am going to talk about product management, and to talk about that, I, I wanted to bring up our, our mission. Um, I don't know how many of you go to our documentation or read uh, mission statements from wikis uh, or whatnot, but this is, this, is, um, this is sort of what we set out to do five years, five years, six years, seven years, however many, it's been a long number of years, 11 summits, I guess, I saw this morning, that's terrifying. Uh, so we set out to do this, to produce a, a, a ubiquitous platform uh, that will meet the needs of public and private clouds and be simple to implement massively scalable. I think there's a flaw in this. Um, and the flaw in this is that it's very clearly targeted at, at deployers. Now, I'm not saying that we've achieved this mission for our deployers. Um, uh, in fact, I'm sure that if I said that in a room of deployers, they would kill me. Um, but but that's, that's, it's, it's very clear just from the verbiage there that we're, we're looking at giving deployers a platform uh, on, that they can use to implement clouds. Um, uh, and and I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about hopefully some ways in which it's very clear that that's what we've done uh, in a little bit uh, as a uh, foreshadowing, I, I might get to a point where I'm just going to rant a while. Um, uh, in any case, this is sort of what we're doing. Uh, when you listen to the Jonathan this morning, um, and, and you listen to sort of the things we're wanting to do these days, uh, there's this other class of humans um, that, that may have been left out of this mission statement, uh, but might be sort of important. And that's, that's the humans who might want to use the cloud uh, to, to do something. Um, in fact, like the, the federated identity uh, demonstration is, is a really great example of that. It's Nothing about that technology demonstration was about how anyone had deployed OpenStack. It wasn't about how anybody was running OpenStack. It was that they were using it to run workloads across multiple clouds, um, which it turns out is something that I do as well. Uh, so it's sort of near and dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so to achieve that mission, uh, we set up our organization uh, borrowing some things from, uh, from the Ubuntu project. Um, uh, and I promise it's relevant that I'm mentioning this. Uh, we, we picked a time-based release thing, uh, which has allowed us to never skip a release in the history of OpenStack. We've released on time every time, partially because we define releases by the time that we release them. Uh, so it's partially tautological, but you know, uh, we, we've accomplished it. It's pretty cool. Uh, and we had these design summits, which are a great e excuse for us to get together and, and drink and or uh, you know, work with each other uh, in person. Uh, and I think that's also allowed us to, to grow the community. Uh, and, and then our, our code names in alphabetical order, which is uh, less relevant, although I will say that we started uh, with release names in alphabetical order, and if you've been around Ubuntu for a long time, you'll know that their first couple uh, weren't, and there's a, there's a weird ordering uh, problem if you go too far back in history. Uh, also, you may or may not know that our second release is pronounced bear, uh, even though there's an X in the middle of it. But um, Anyway, so there's a couple things we did different from Ubuntu, and these are really relevant to, to a discussion of product management. Um, and that's that we do not have uh, a, a, a BDFL. It's a benevolent dictator for life. That's uh, when Mr. Shuttleworth started the, the Ubuntu project. He sort of anointed himself as that so that there would be a person who, at times that it's needed, could make a decision. Um, we, we don't have that. Uh, it's by design. Uh, and, and because of that, we... Uh, we're doing that so that everything is democratic and so that every, everybody can be included. Um, when, you, when, you have that sort of, uh, when you have that sort of strong decision-making power, it is necessarily exclusive um, and, and useful and can be tactical and can be very pleasant at times, uh, but also can not be. I mean, unity can happen. Um, uh, wow, well, yeah. Uh, so what that's allowed us to do is this, uh, and we like to talk about how, how many people are involved, and that might just sound like it's self-aggrandizing, but I actually think that it's, it's, it's a lot of the point of what we're doing. Um, it's not that we have a set of five smart people over in the corner writing some smart cloud software. We have, we have a collaboration from a whole bunch of different people who have a whole bunch of different points of view, um, and we are inclusive of those points of view, uh, or at least we want to be. Uh, and so we can, we can have numbers like 430 uh, associated companies. We can have numbers like 2,600 uh, cumulative contributors. These are actually very old numbers. I believe that the current cumulative contributor count is over 3,000. Um, uh, but I, I, 
already had this uh, cut out and put into HTML, so I apologize for not updating the numbers, but, but they're really not the point. The, the actual values aren't as much as that there's, it turns out, uh, a lot of people with a lot of different vested interests from a lot of, a lot of backgrounds. Um, so this has led us to this interesting point where we have, we have folks uh, making a call saying that OpenStack needs product management. Um, and, and I think that uh, while I, I agree with some aspects of that, um, I think that in some cases it's, it's code um, for people thinking that this is a problem um, or for people thinking that this happens at all. Because, because actually we don't really have a lot of developers just sitting around working on whatever, whatever they feel like. Um, I, I mentioned it in, in the last slide, but I'd like to, I'd like to go back to it again. Um, we have 430 companies. If you think that we don't have any product management so involved in OpenStack, you are living in a, you're living in a dream world. We have 430 companies worth of product management. Um, so it's not that we need product management in OpenStack. I believe what we need is we need product management coordination. Uh, we, we need for the product managers of these different companies to talk to each other. Uh, we need for them to get together and we need for them to figure it out because right now, how they're doing prioritization is they're all coming to the developers and they're essentially communicating to each other through their associated development organizations. And if you think about how that might work at your own company, um, that the various product managers on a, on a product only talk to each other via sending messages through the engineering team, um, one can imagine, one can imagine that, that things might get a little bit hectic uh, and that, that it might not be as, as clear um, uh, as, as what the, the outcome of that might be. Um, so, so to this end, there's a, there's a group, uh, the product management working group, um, it's, it's not a product management committee. I'm not sure that I can explain to you the difference between a working group and a committee, but apparently there's a big difference because I think we talked about it for about a half an hour yesterday at the board meeting. Um, uh, and I, I'm still not really sure what the difference is, uh, and I'm sure that's going to get me in trouble. Uh, but today, uh, uh, if you, um, not that you shouldn't, you know, of course, hang out in here uh, and, and uh, enjoy all of the, all the wonderful content, but if you feel like you want to talk to people uh, about the product management working group, um, there's, a, there's a group of them talking today from 2 to 3.30 uh, in room 212. Uh, it's one of the, one of the uh, there's actually more than one shout out to other, other talks in here, which is also sort of a strange thing. Um, but so they'll, they'll be getting together and this is a, this is a nascent group, but, but this is actually what this is. It's a group of product managers from the companies that are, that are involved getting together and starting to, starting to figure out how to have these conversations. It's not exactly like there's a straightforward answer to, to how this body is going to, or how a body of product managers uh, would interact with, um, uh, with our technical community. Um, because there's a few things that uh, a set of product managers can do, and there's, a, there's some things they can't do. Um, so one of the things they could do, which would be really helpful, is defining problems. Um, right? Actually looking at what are the things that we're doing, uh, making clear definitions, what are, the, what are the problems that need to be solved. Um, also, between them, coordinating priorities. If you have 450 companies worth of product managers all thinking that their thing is the absolute most important thing in the history of mankind, um, then it's you know sort of the equivalent of getting uh, you know a 450 critical bugs, and you must fix them all uh, at, the, uh, at the top priority, um, uh, which means that effectively you have no priority. Um, so, so them coordinating some priorities amongst themselves and saying, you know what, maybe if we all worked on this, uh, then that will enable us to work on these other things, which would be really, really spectacular. Um, they could also communicate the problems that they've, uh, that they've come up with clearly to the tech community. Um, they can't tell the tech community what to do. That's sort of not how this works. None of us can tell any of the rest of us what to do. If they came and said, we have to have this thing in Nova, uh, there's, there's nothing that John can do to force the Nova developers to do that particular thing. But when you clearly articulate something, if you clearly articulate a problem, if you say, hey, listen, this is, we've, you know, not just I'm running around in the corner waving my hands in the air, but I've actually, I've actually sort of sketched out for you uh, some, some issues that should, should be addressed, um, then that's actually something that can be engaged with, right? People can, people can, can latch on to that and, um, uh, and potentially start to make steps to, uh, to make that better. Um, so that's theoretical. Uh, I, I sort of have some problems with OpenStack. Um, and so I thought that as a, as a, as a good product manager, uh, oh, I should mention that, that as with everything at OpenStack, it's completely inclusive. So if you want to go, no matter who you are, and participate in the product management working group, you don't have to be employed as a product manager to do that. Uh, you, can, you can go express yourself uh, in whatever way uh, suits you. Um, maybe not whatever way suits you. I think there's a few that are probably inappropriate. Um, 
But, uh, but you can do that. So I, I, I figured I'd, I'd maybe take a stab at, at a couple of those things that I think the product management working group could do uh, and maybe, maybe describe some things that, that, uh, that maybe are, are problematic, uh, could be better from the perspective of a person trying to use OpenStack. Uh, and, and hopefully that might, might shed some light at least on to, uh, well, me, because I like talking about myself. Um, so uh, I decided that I would take a stab at writing use cases. <laughs> um, we don't do this in OpenStack very often, uh, but I, I thought it would be fun. I've been learning to be all you know, corporate and stuff. Um, so, uh, so as an application developer, I, I, would, I want to deploy and run an application on the internet so that my customers all the, over the world can consume it. I think that's a reasonably understandable thing that somebody might want to do with the cloud. Um, also, uh, I want to deploy that application across multiple clouds so that my service is resilient against issues uh, in any one of them. So if one of the clouds goes down, I don't want my users to know that. Uh, in, in other talks, I've put up a nice uh, slide about Netflix, but I decided I would not do that here. But, you know, uh, we, we all love it when uh, you can't watch um, uh, House of Cards because AWS is down. Uh, it's, you know, sort of a, a problem with a single vendor ecosystem. Um, so I want to I do those things. And, and it turns out um, this is a thing that you can do. It is totally possible. Um, we are collectively doing this right now as we sit in this room uh, because there's an automated system that's, uh, that's, that's doing that um, currently. This actually is not the current graph because God only knows what the internet uh, would be like at a conference, um, but uh, this is a snapshot of a live graph from just a little while ago uh, showing uh, a system building nodes. Uh, this is a system that does 10 to 20,000 VMs a day uh, on currently three, soon to be six uh, clouds, uh, and it only does it using the OPN stack API. So I'm not talking about uh, how are we going to make a future state where the world uh, finally works. It works. It's working great. It's working in production. It works every day. It works all over the place. Um, it's a little harder than it might need to be. Uh, and although I've got it working, uh, it might take somebody else a little bit uh, more time than it, maybe it should to get that done. So to, to run your application on one or more OpenStack clouds uh, in a resilient way, I, I believe there's a few steps that you need to, to go through to do that. Um, you, you need a base image. Uh, you, you may make it, you may fetch it, you may find it, uh, but there has to be an image that you're going to boot. Uh, it needs to be in your clouds. Uh, you, you're going to boot a, a VM uh, on, on one or more of the clouds, uh, and you're going to ensure it's on the internet. That, that might sound <laughs> obvious or simplistic, um, uh, but, but it, it turns out maybe it's not. Um, so, uh, so step one. Uh, get a base image. Uh, there's a few different ways you can do this. Uh, OpenStack has a tool called Disk Image Builder. It's not the world's most inventive name. Um, uh, and I apologize, it doesn't start with M, because I believe that most of the new projects these days start with M for some reason that I haven't been able to figure out. Uh, so it's, it's a, unfortunately has a descriptive name, so I, I apologize for the boringness, uh, but you can use it to make disk, image, uh, disk images. There's other tools. You don't have to use OpenStack's tool to, to make disk images. You could use tools like Packer. Uh, you could also download images that other people have made for you. The fine folks at both Ubuntu and Fedora and many of the other distros make and upload images that you can use uh, in clouds and, and you, can, you can consume those. So this isn't trying to pitch a workload where you have to build images all the time. If, if you want to build an image, great. If you want to use somebody else's image, uh, great. Um, so you'd think that that's a thing that you could do. Um, but but unfortunately, um, you can't just build an image uh, or download an image um, because you need to know what hypervisor your cloud is running. Um, and you need to know the file format that that hypervisor requires the images to be in. Um, uh, as a, some examples, Rackspace uses VHD for their file format. HP uses QCOW2. DreamHost uses RAW. Um, you have to know this. It isn't, isn't told to you anywhere in the, in the Keystone catalog. It's not, it's not communicated anywhere technically. It's just a thing you have to know. So if you get an image, you might have to transcode it into a couple of different image formats, or you might have to transcode it into the image format that's appropriate for your cloud. It's a little silly. Um, so OK, great. All right, that's fine. People make choices. The product management at one cloud had made one choice. The product management at another cloud made another choice. We enabled them to do that because we're OpenStack and we're inclusive of people's ideas. Uh, now I can just upload it uh, to the cloud. So I'm going to say glance image create, and I left off a parameter here. I'm sorry. This is not functional code in the slide. Uh, but you're going to create an image in the cloud, uh, except you're not. Um, because the next thing that you need to know uh, is you need to know the image API version. Um, and you need to know that because the, the, there are two API versions out in the wild, and 
uh, there are two API versions that are currently running on multiple different public clouds, and so you have to know which of those uh, is there. Um, uh, so, as a, for instance, HP is currently using V1 and Vexhost, which is another public cloud, uh, uses V2, uh, and they both work quite nicely. Um, there are these, there's this API endpoint for Glance, uh, which will give you the list of versions that the Glance, is, that the Glance on that cloud is running. Um, for reasons surpassing understanding, that information is not accessible anywhere through the Keystone catalog. Um, so if you go to the Keystone catalog and it gives you a list of the, of the, the endpoints in the cloud, it gives you one of the versioned uh, URLs without any way to get to the thing that might give you the list of versioned APIs uh, and, and their associated URLs. There is a session, by the way, this week uh, to talk about this topic uh, and to talk about uh, Keystone uh, service catalog uh, metadata alignment uh, across things, uh, and I fully intend to be in that session uh, and talk to people about that, because it's one of those things you'd like to be able to uh, figure out. Um, uh, so, since that doesn't work, uh, what you can do is you can grab the URL from, from the thing and you can parse the end of it to see if the string v1 or v2 happens to be at the end of the URL that you've been given. These might or might not be present on the URL that you get back from the service catalog because it's not actually part of an interface. Um, but you can probably figure out if it has a v2 on the end of it that it's a v2 API. Um, this is, of course, bananas. Um, OK, so that's fine. So I figured out it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. I figured out that my cloud, this cloud has v1, and I'm going to upload it, and I'm going to do glance image create. And this time, I'm going to do a file name, which is still not syntactically correct. Uh, it's actually dash dash file, um, and then the file name. So I'm going to do that. Uh, and uh, that, yeah, sorry, that's not going uh, to work. We're going to uh, have our worst cat eat some more lettuce. Um, because it turns out that there are, even within the v1 and the v2 APIs of Glance, there are two different ways uh, in which you can upload an image to Glance. And your cloud providers have been given the flexibility uh, to, uh, to only turn on one or only turn on the other. Um, because there's this, there's this concept called policy.json, which allows you to map uh, roles uh, and, uh, and, and privileges to individual API calls. Uh, this is, of course, also bananas um, and not a thing that is useful to a user. So you have to know, you have to know ahead of time. It's a priori knowledge that you have to have as to whether or not your cloud requires you to upload something to Swift and then import it, or whether it will allow you to use the rest put call uh, to put the image into the cloud. It is not possible to discover, um, ev even though both of the API calls are valid API calls in the Glance v2 API. Um, so uh, but the, the bottom Glance image create uh, on this one actually is, is correct, syntactically at least now. So you can, you can, run, <laughs> you can run the commands on this slide, uh, sadly. So that, that top one is what you have to do uh, if, it's a, if it's an image import. Uh, and you, yes, you do in fact have to pass JSON on the command line uh, as a parameter. Um, so I, in, in terms of making a better user interface, I would suggest that passing JSON on the command line is not a good user interface. Um, although passing JSON to a REST endpoint is of course fine. Um, so, okay, so that's great. So I've, I've, at this point I've uploaded something and now it should be easy. I'm gonna boot that image uh, into a VM. As you might expect, we're <laughs> you're gonna see this picture again because it's not that easy. Um, so, uh, so the thing is, is that the image that I uploaded to the thing needs to be able to get onto the network in the cloud that it's running in. Um, and although there are some standard protocols for doing dynamic host configuration, um, not everybody uses them. Um, so you could have a cloud that, uh, that sends configuration to the VMs running inside of it using uh, the dynamic host configuration protocol. Uh, you, you could have ones that put a static network config into config drive. Um, uh, or you could have uh, clouds that want a vendor-specific agent running in your VM uh, that will do file injection uh, using some sort of magic uh, and will overwrite files in the VM that, that you decided to run. Um, because you always want somebody else. I mean, the NSA is going to do it for you anyway. But, you know, other than them, I, I tend to not like people writing things into my, into my computers. Um, so these are, these are options. And, and I'd like to, be, because use cases are useful, I'd like to go back to the the part where I said I wanted to, I wanted to upload the same thing uh, to more than one cloud. Uh, I, I don't want to have to build a per cloud provider image. If I'm going to do that, I might as well have a, oh, that's, hey, meeting. Look at that. I got a meeting with Interante in just a little bit. Oh, no. This is terrible. 
Why are you doing this to me, Google? All right, well, you're going to see all sorts of things, I'm sure, here. That's exciting. Yeah, they probably should. Um, so, uh, uh, so in any case, I, I, I don't want to have to, to build a completely separate uh, image for each of my clouds. I, I kind of want to do that task once, or download it once and convert it three times, or, or whatever that is. But I would like to be able to know that I've got the same content uh, across, the, across my cloud providers that I'm using. Um, and if one of them uses DHCP and one of them uses uh, some sort of uh, vendor-specific host inje uh, file injection, I'm guessing the vendor-specific host file injection won't work on the other cloud that doesn't support that vendor-specific thing. So once again, we've, we've given uh, we've, we've been very inclusive of people's ideas, uh, and the users have suffered. Um, okay, great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to boot an image uh, now, and I've, I've gone back and I've rebuilt my images, and I've done evil things to make sure that the, that the image actually can talk to the network on each of the clouds that I've got. Um, except, of course, it's not that easy, um, because it's not just... The, it's not just the network there in the cloud I want to talk to. I said in my earlier use case that I wanted to run something on the internet. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. There's this thing called the internet that allows computers to talk to each other across the entire world. And, and people have built a commerce system on top of it uh, that, that allows you to, to exchange money for goods and services um, uh, over things called websites. Uh, and it, it's a pretty common use case. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it, it's, it's not just that I'm, I'm sort of an esoteric tech person. I want to run my service that can connect to the world. Um, so that's sadly harder than uh, you might want it to be. Um, my VM may have been given to me with a public IP address. Uh, that public IP address might have even come to the VM over DHCP, which is kind of really cool. Um, it may not. It may need a floating IP uh, from Nova to get out onto the internet. Or it may need a floating IP from Neutron to get on, uh, out onto the internet. Um, these are all fantastic uh, choices, and, and they make my life as a, as a user, the, the complexity of that, much more enriched. Uh, I, I, really, I really enjoy it. Um, just just as, a, as an example real quick, so if you've ever gotten, uh, used the, 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 the Nova REST API, and you get, I've translated some JSON into YAML here because it's more readable, um, it's the same thing. So this is the addresses field out of, out of a, a Nova server object. Um, uh, on a VM that's running Nova Network. You'll notice that it has two entries in it, private and public, and each of those has an address. Um, I can look for that, and if that's there, I know that this is a Nova Network thing, and I probably can tell because the name is public that that's a public, uh, that that's a public network. Um, this is, uh, oh, that's titled poorly. Uh, this is one uh, that is a VM that is on a cloud uh, that is uh, running Neutron. Um, and you'll notice that although it has an addresses field, the content of the, the addresses field is completely different. Um, so as a user, I can go in and I can see if it had a public and a private entry, or I can see if it has a network name entry that inside of it uh, has some structures in terms of the address uh, and, uh, and the version of that, um, which is really helpful to me. It's exactly what I've always wanted to do is have my code to boot a single VM have to pick out the difference between whether the deployer decided to deploy Nova Network or Neutron. Um, in case you're not aware, there's going to be some people talking about the Nova Network Neutron thing all this week. I, if you have thoughts or opinions on that, I, I suggest you find them and you know, uh, give them a nice hug, uh, possibly hand them a beer uh, or two, uh, or a case, because uh, there's some work to be done there. Um, so that's great. OK, so, so I figured out that I, on this cloud, I've got I've to create a floating IP to get my VM on the network so that it can talk to people who want to give me money for you know, the pictures of worst cats that I apparently I'm obsessed with. Um, so now I have to do these things. I have to boot it, and then I have to create a floating IP, and then I have to associate it with my server. I'm not including the, 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 the different version of doing that that works with Neutron, uh, but it's, it's similar. Uh, you can also use the Nova pass-through if you have Neutron, So you know because that choice is definitely uh, useful. Um, it turns out uh, that we're not done figuring out the, the things that the cloud has done to get between me and the internet. Um, there are these things called security groups, uh, because for some reason, somebody thinks that it's a great idea to put a production server behind a NAT. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I know very few ops people who said to themselves, I want to run my production servers that need to talk to the internet behind a NAT. In fact, if you go get like you know residential DSL, you can usually 
up, get an upsell for it to get a real non-natted IP address because you might want to run a server. Um, it's a kind of common thing. Um, but apparently, there's a set of people out there who think this is, should be the default behavior of all servers that you create in a cloud. Uh, I'd like to invite any of those people to ever run a production service. Um, because clearly they haven't. Uh, so there are these security group things which block all of my traffic unless I explicitly ask for it to be able to talk to the internet. So not only is it matted, but it's firewalled. So I'm now getting something that is actually less good than my residential DSL service on my production VM that I'm trying to use to run a production application. Um, I'm probably, if I'm not, you know, quite antiquated, going to be using things like Ansible and Puppet to actually run that machine, which means that me running IP tables on the machine is probably pretty easy, or EB tables or whatever they've renamed it to this month, um, or systemd, because I'm sure it's probably systemd that's handling that now. But in any case, uh, I don't necessarily need the, the, the cloud to firewall me from the thing that I wanted to get to. So, so now what we've got, uh, because I'm going to run a web server on this, is now I've got to add a rule to the default security group. I could do this in a more complicated way by adding a new security group with its own set of rules. Uh, but right here, we're just going to add one to the default security group uh, that opens port 80. So now I get, to, I get to add port 80 to be open on the security group, then boot it, then create an IP address, uh, and, and then associate it with that. And I'd like to point out, in case you, you weren't tracking that, that's two different ways that the, that the cloud defaulted in not having my machine be able to talk to the internet. Not only is it behind an at, it's also got a weird firewall. Uh, and, and it's on a private network uh, by default. This is, of course, uh, not very fun to me. So um, in summation, uh, the things that I had to figure out to boot a VM uh, are what format did my cloud provider decide that they want to, to uh, what hypervisor did they decide to run so I know what image format. What's the image API version? Which of the image API uh, which of the image API upload mechanisms has the cloud decided to allow me to use? Um, does this cloud support public networking by default, or does it put me on a private network by default? Uh, is it using Nova Network or Neutron? Is it, uh, do I have to use a floating IP to get to the internet? If I have to use a floating IP, do I have to use Nova or Neutron? Um, is my cloud provider giving me uh, its internal networking information via DHCP or a static config of some sort? And do I need to do something with the security group? This is an insane amount of steps and information that one needs to do to boot a VM. It is, it is crap, and we need to fix it. I think we can do better than that. Um, so I like to rant at people, but I also like to fix things. Um, so I, I've, I've been poking at this a little bit, um, uh, at least for my own sake, because I am narcissistic and I'd like to solve my problems before I solve your problems. Um, so there's a few things that we've spun up over the last cycle. There's a library that we wrote called OS Client Config, which makes me sad. Uh, it shouldn't have to exist, but it needs to, um, because there's a bunch of information you need to know about cloud providers. Well. So we have a vendors.py file in OS Cloud Config, that, or excuse me, OS Client Config, that, uh, that lists all of the a priori knowledge that you need to know about each of the public clouds that I am aware of. That I have had to write this just makes me want to cry into my beer. Uh, but it exists, and you can use it, uh, and you can reuse it with other things. It's also now being consumed by Python, uh, the Python OpenStack client. So the, the unified Python client now allows you to reference a, a, a named vendor cloud as, as what you're going to point to. It also knows things like the auth URL, uh, so that you don't have to put a, a, a crap ton of stuff in your, in your config file. So that's there. It's, uh, it, it can be used today. This is also uh, being used behind the, the new version of Ansible modules that are going out there. So, so hopefully at some point just saying I'm using Vexhost or I'm using Runabove or I'm using United Stack. By the way, I'm not sure if you guys know, but there's a lot of OpenStack public clouds out there. I've sort of discovered that recently. Uh, and they all work pretty well. Um, uh, we've also written this library called Shade uh, that's being hosted over in the infra, uh, in the infra project. It's, uh, it's a library to wrap the business logic around the client libraries that we've discovered. Uh, I kind of think that that it existing is also a, a, a bit of a failure, um, but, uh, but there it is. So um, the, the goal there being that you can make a simple call like create server and please give me an IP, and it will do all of the things that you need to do to create a server and give you an IP. Uh, this is being rolled out into Infra's node pool, the thing that spins up and tears down our, our machines all day long. So you know we're testing the ever-loving mess out of it. Uh, <laughs> it will be pretty solid. Uh, if it's not solid, you're not getting test VMs in the, in the OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, and also, uh, again, the Ansible modules upstream uh, are, are starting to consume that as well. Um, 
that will before I go on to that. Uh, currently, that's wrapping the Python open the Python star client libraries. Uh, the, the next step of goal is to port that onto Python OpenStack SDK when, when that's ready. Uh, and then potentially we'll talk in the future about whether that needs to be like a simple version on top of the SDK or whether it makes sense to be two different things. Uh, ultimately, uh, having all of these different uh, choices for people is, is something we need to uh, 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 consolidate it on. So, so I mentioned we can raise issues. Um, and so I've been doing this. Uh, uh, there's a, I mentioned the product management working group uh, later today. Uh, it's got other things. I, I try and uh, uh, be as involved with them as I can because I have some opinions. Um, DEF Core is also uh, a place where, where work is, is being done in this area. Um, they're, they're working on testing clouds for interoperability. Uh, and recently, we've gotten to the state with that, with that process where, where the tests are discovering that the clouds are divergent in some ways uh, and, and putting that into strong relief uh, so that we know that we need to go address things uh, and make them better. Uh, so they're doing a meeting tomorrow. They're also doing a meeting today at, at 2, I believe. Uh, but also tomorrow at 10.30 to 12.30, they'll be doing a working session. Um, and then uh, as Flavio will be, will be happy, I'm sure, to, to back me up on, I, I'm more than happy to go talk to the, to the, the cores and PTLs directly uh, and tell them just how much uh, I like uh, a particular interface uh, that they've provided me. Uh, they really enjoy it, uh, I, I think. Um, it's, it's love. There it is. I got a thumbs up. That's fantastic. Um, so that's just what I've been doing about it. More largely, I think this is a it's a it's a community effort that we've got to we've got to get behind. Um, I think that there's some basics that that we need to we need to handle. Um, being able to handle all of the all of the really complicated crazy things is a fantastic thing, and OpenStack is really good at it, right? The things you can do with with overlay networks and Neutron and 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 different ways you can you can stitch things together are are really neat. Um, but it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be that hard to do the simple everyday things, right? We should, we should do that. And the thing is, is that that, that involves making decisions. Uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to suggest that the existence of the shade library that I've been putting together is a bug. Um, every, every single line of code in it is an indication that there's a bug somewhere else. Um, and, and I think that it wouldn't be the world's worst thing to, to look at that and figure out how we can actually make the projects themselves not have to, uh, n not have to expose that much divergence to the users. Um, it means we have to make some, diver uh, some decisions about divergent uh, at, at the very basic level. So in the places where there are two just completely diametrically opposed viewpoints, I would suggest that either we need to get rid of one of them or we need to make it very clearly discoverable at a, at a technical level so that with, with an explanation of why a user would want to use one or the other, an end user, not a deployer. Uh, the deployers have plenty of choice, they have too much choice uh, as it is, but, but we need to be able to, 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 uh, to ratchet that down for people. Um, and I think we need to be able to find the ability to take a stand um, even when we have a product manager at a particular company uh, that, that has strong disagreement. It, it's okay. We all have different differences of opinion. We've got to make sure that, that as we're coming to consensus in the technical community, that that consensus is including the product management from the, from the different companies that's involved uh, and isn't, isn't just information that, that's coming over the, over the wall to us. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's me rambling uh, for a period of time. Uh, if for any reason uh, you want to do something with the slides, they are uh, posted uh, on, uh, at that URL. They're also uh, in, my, uh, in my GitHub account, uh, so you can clone them. I have no idea what purpose that would serve for you, but they are there, and they're licensed Creative Commons, so, you know, go nuts, uh, or whatever it is that you want to do. Anyway, thank you very much. All right, so thank you so much, Monty. Uh, so folks, uh, we went a little over, apologize about that. Make sure that uh, you get your survey, feel free to fill it out, and please return it uh, to the, our, our uh, assistants at the, at the door. Next up, we have Bill Franklin. So I'm just gonna give a minute for folks to exchange and get into your seats. Um, for those that are just arriving, you, you'll find that there are surveys on your seat. You can fill those out at the end of the, uh, end of the session so you can provide us a little bit of feedback on uh, how you feel that uh, the sessions went and whether or not you got any value from it. 